Today, like Angie said, we're going to uh, continue talking about peace. Last week, we uh, introduced the topic, talked about peace, talked about the meaning of peace, the thoughts of peace that we see in the Bible. What does it mean to have peace in the Bible? Uh, we talked about the Old Testament word uh, that you guys have probably already heard before many times, the word shalom. It's a Hebrew word meaning peace, but not just peace or a stoppage of war, but it's peace in our body, our soul, in our spirits. It's not just one part of peace. It's the complete package. It's every part. So when it's talking about the shalom peace of God, it's talking about finances. It's talking about provision. It's talking about health. It's talking about wholeness in relationships. It's talking about hope for the future. All of the things that we need from the Lord are what we see in the one word, peace. You know, in our lives, sometimes we can search for peace in other places. We can search for peace in our bank account. Oh, if I have this much money, maybe then I'll have peace. But in order, sometimes in order to get that, we have to sacrifice something in another, in another area. And so maybe we'll have financial peace because we have this much money, but maybe our relationships aren't so great. Or maybe you think, okay, if I only have this new thing, a new car or a great moto or something, then I'll have peace. Okay, so maybe you get that, but then your finances are lacking. God wants the whole package for all of us. So it's not just one part here or one part there or something that maybe it's only for just a short time. No, God has the whole package for us. It's the shalom piece. It's our relationships, our finances. Everything that God has for us, it's what he wants for us. It's what they talk about, what Jesus talked about in John 10.10, 10, where he says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to bring you life. An abundant life. Abundant life. Jesus lived the abundant life. Amen? Amen? You guys agree with me or not? Or, you know, you know when they, when they, uh, the Sunday school answer is always Jesus, right? So if you don't know the answer, say it's Jesus, right? Who lived the abundant life? Jesus. All right, you guys are catching on. Awesome. Yeah, Jesus lived the abundant life. We see that maybe from the outside looking in, Taking a look at some of the stuff that Jesus faced, it may not be the definition of peace that we might think. You know, he preached some and he was accepted by many, but then there was another group who wanted to kill him. That doesn't sound like a lot of peace. You know, sometimes you think, okay, as everybody likes me, then they'll have peace. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Jesus lived the abundant life and he had peace, peace in his soul, peace in his heart. Even as he was going to the cross, he lived a submitted life, knew that his life was in the hands of his heavenly father. And so even in the, the difficulties, he was living that life of peace. And he is the example. And so if you want to look at someone who's living the abundant life, living the peaceful life, that's Jesus. And it doesn't mean that everything's, you know, perfect and stress-free and you just kind of float through life? No, no. Sometimes peace means God giving us the strength to overcome. Sometimes we have difficulties in our life. Sometimes we think, okay, if God just takes this out, well, no, maybe what God wants to give you strength to climb that mountain rather than that mountain being removed. God does things and he allows things in our life so that we can have a strength-filled life. And so sometimes I think it's important for us not to just get into this box of, okay, if my life is like this, then that's the peaceful life. No heartache, no, uh, no problems, just kind of floating through life. No, God wants to give us strength to live a victorious life, a God-filled life. And so I think we need to make sure that we always have the right thoughts when we're thinking about peace. 
Today we're going to talk about peace with God. Next week we're going to talk about peace within ourselves. But this week we're going to talk about peace with God and what that means. Let me read you a verse in Rome, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. Okay, we have it up on the screen there. It says, for he himself is our peace. Okay, let's say that after me. For he himself is our peace. That's Jesus, okay? The Sunday school answer again. Jesus, Jesus himself is our peace. In Isaiah, it says that Jesus, one of the names of Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus himself is is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Now, I want you to look at that word for a minute, hostility. In other versions, it talks, it uses the word enmity. Uh, but I think, I think that the, the word hostile is a good word. It basically means we're like enemies to God. There's a wall of hostility between us and God. Okay, sometimes we like to think about the good news, but this is the truth. This is before the good news. This is the bad news. We are separated from God. There is a wall of hostility between us and God if we don't have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Jesus has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Okay, let's go. And might recon reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we invite you to speak to us this afternoon. Lord, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on that cross for us to break down the wall of hostility the, the wall that separates us, the wall of our rebellion, the wall of our selfishness, you have broken that down. You have made the way so that we can come to you and experience peace, perfect peace in your presence and with you at all times, God. Speak to us. Help us to grow in understanding of you. Help us to grow closer to you. Help us to live in closer connection and communion with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Another verse in Romans, 8, chap or Romans chapter 8, verses 5 to 7. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity, hostility towards God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. I think it's important for us to understand the state of our lives without God. Not to make us all depressed, but to see the reality of the situation. Without God, we're hopeless. We're enemies of God. We are hostile towards God. Our flesh is hostile. It's an enemy to God. It's like... Or a person who is living in the, in, in, in the kingdom. Okay? And we said, okay, I'm going to live my own way. I don't want the laws of this kingdom anymore. I'm going to go. I'm going to go outside the kingdom. 
outside the jurisdiction of the king, and I'm going to go outside the borders, and I'm going to live my life in the wicked cities outside the kingdom. And so we're just saying, okay, I'm going to live my life my way. And so we start doing it, and kind of like the prodigal son, we start living a wild life. But then we suddenly realize that the kingdom has declared war against the place that we're living. And he's come to abolish. He's come to judge. He's come to say, this is not right. Not to destroy us, but to his desire is to, to liberate the captives. And so we have to realize that our lives without God is hostile towards God. We are enemies of God. It's not like we're just kind of oh, living our life. No, we are rejecting the one who created us. He gave us breath. And we're using that same breath to say, God, I don't need you. I'm going to live life my way. Thank you. He's our creator. And we're saying, nope, it's my way. He's our owner. He's like, no, God, I don't need you. He's our ruler. We're saying, no, I'm going to rule. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it the way that I think. I'm going to, I'm going to live it my way. That's, that's who we are without God. This is the reality. I know it's not fun to think about, but it's the truth. This is what, this is what Ephesians, okay? I was reading, we've read a little bit of Ephesians chapter 2. This is, how the, this is how Paul, in the book of Ephesians, describes us before faith in Jesus. Okay? This is just from one chapter, chapter 2. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. We walked according to the course of this world. We walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in sons of disobedience. We conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. We fulfilled the desires of our flesh and of our mind. We were by nature children of wrath. We were Gentiles in our flesh. We were not set apart to God. We are aliens from Israel. We are strangers from the covenant of promise. We have no hope. We are without God in the world. We're separated from God. We're far off from God. We are at enmity with God. This is describing who we are. This is a person without peace. Amen? Okay, this is a person without peace. Okay? We can say, oh yeah, we, we're going to do it our way, but really, as myself and probably a lot of us here have experienced in the past, living our lives in our own way does not lead us into peace. But what does is coming to the Prince of Peace and saying, God, when we stop and we come to the end of ourselves and we realize that everything that we try to do is futile, everything that we seek for to bring peace to ourselves doesn't work. C.S. Lewis said, if I find a desire in my heart that nothing on this earth can fulfill that shows me that, that I am made for another world. I am made, we're made to run on a relationship with Jesus. The things of this world won't fill us, but God will. They won't fill us with peace, but the Prince of Peace will fill us with the peace that we need. When we come and we stop and we come to the end of ourselves, the end of our hostility, the end of our enmity, and we fall down on our knees and we say, God, I'm done. I'm done. I've tried it all. There's nothing else. I need you. That's the beginning. The, the Prince of Peace comes, floods us with peace, fills us with hope, and sets our course anew again. That's what God wants for each one of us. We need to come to the realization that all that we long for, all that we're trying, all of the sin that we're 
living our lives in, it will never, ever satisfy. Even if we are righteous and we try to do it all on our own again, that still won't satisfy us either. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. This is the beginning of peace. Amen? I know many of you here have experienced that peace. I would love to hear. We could spend hours just telling our stories of that moment when we experienced that peace, when God flooded our soul. And I'm sure that if you guys were to come up and tell your stories, you'd probably remember back on that, that time you met with Jesus. And some of you would probably bring tears to your eyes about during that time, remembering the love and the peace that just overwhelms you. This is the peace that God has for us. When we make peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus took all of that hostility on himself. He took all of that sin, all of that enmity. And for one time in his life, when he had never experienced separation from God, he hung on the cross and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was experiencing the separation that was ours. He had never experienced it before. But he was experiencing the separation of sin. And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He did that for us. He did that so that that wall of hostility could be broken down. And we can come into a relationship with God that brings peace to our souls. Romans 10.9 If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That word saved is a special Greek word. And it's used in different places in the New Testament. Sometimes it's used when Jesus did a miracle and he healed somebody. So, for a physical healing and a physical body, they use this word. It's the word sozo. You might have heard it before. So, in a physical body, there was a physical healing. There was a sozo in that person's body. It was a, a miracle done. When Jesus delivered people, they were uh, like the de demoniac or uh, the people who were filled with demons. When Jesus delivered them, same word. And salvation, same word. Saved, delivered, healed. Saved, delivered, healed. Healing in our bodies, deliverance in our souls, salvation in our spirits. Body, soul, and spirit. The peace of God is for our bodies, our souls, and our spirits. And Jesus came to bring a miracle for each of us, for our bodies, our souls, and our spirits. It's not just one part, but God wants you to experience peace in your body, soul, and in your spirit. This is the peace that God has for us. Amen? This is the peace that God has for us. And so when we come into that by confessing with our mouth and believing in our heart, then we have peace with God. We are no longer enemies of God, but we are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Now we're in the family of God. We're in the family of God, and everything that is Jesus' is, is ours too. God said, if God would not spare his only son, how much more would he give us, wouldn't he give us all of the things that we need? So we can expect all of those things. When the prodigal son came home, this, the father welcomed him into the house. He was a son again. He had the authority of the family. 
put the, the rings on his finger, the shoes on his feet, the coat around his shoulders. He had all that he needed again in the house. Okay? That's the peace that God wants, and that's the peace that God has for all of us. That's peace with God. That's salvation. That's the good news. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not that God just likes us and he has pity on us. Jesus fulfilled, Jesus fulfilled the price to bring us into the presence of God. It's not like just, God is just up in heaven. Oh, yeah, okay, I guess. I'll just feel sorry for people. Let them come in. No. It had to be a legal price that was paid. It's a legal price that was paid for us to come into that relationship with God, come into that peace. And it's the price that Jesus paid. He paid it so that we can come freely before God's throne of grace. And so by confessing and with faith in our hearts, we can come into the presence of God, come into the peace of God. After salvation, after salvation, we need to continue to live. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about uh, forgiveness. And one of the stories we read is about the, uh, the king who forgave the servant, 10,000 talents, 200,000 years worth of work. Okay, that's a lot of work. What did, the, what did the guy do? He received forgiveness. Then he went out, and he didn't show forgiveness. He, he received the forgiveness from the king, but then he didn't live it out. He didn't continue to live a lifestyle of forgiveness. When we receive forgiveness, when we receive salvation, we also need to live it out. We can't just say, all right, God, thanks for saving me. I don't have to go to hell now. I'll see you when I die and I get to go to heaven. But now I'll just live life the way that I want to until I go to heaven. We can't say that. We are bought with a price. We're not our own anymore. Romans 6. Romans 6 is really cool because it talks about in baptism and in salvation, we die. We die with Jesus. We're dead. We're just a corpse. That's all we are. But with Jesus' resurrection, we are resurrected to a new life with Jesus. The life that we live is no longer our own. We are bought with a price by Jesus. So we need to say, God, you're not only my Savior, but you are my Lord. How many, guys, how many of you ever heard of the book, The Case for Faith by Lee Strobel? A few of you here? I don't remember much of that book. But the one story that I do remember is actually from the introduction. I did make it all the way through the book, okay? Just so you know, I did make it all the way through. It's a great book. I recommend it to anybody. But basically, the, the gist of, this, of the book is that um, they're, they're talking about evidences of God, evidences for God. And it's taking 10 different arguments that people use to, to speak against God, and it's basically it's saying how each of these arguments stack up to the truth of the Word of God. And uh, it's a very good book, and I would encourage you to read it if you have a chance. But in the introduction, he talks about a story of a guy named Charles Templeton. Now, Charles Templeton is a Canadian, lived in Toronto, worked at the Toronto Star, if I remember, my, if I remember this story correctly. It's a, uh, a newspaper up in Toronto, still published today. But Charles Templeton got saved right around the time of Billy Graham. Okay? And in his salvation experience, God really spoke to him and changed his life. 
and he was a contemporary of Billy Graham. They got to know each other, and they spent time together, and they were about the same age, and people were always comparing the two of them. They said, oh, Charles Templeton, he's got a great future as a preacher. He's very eloquent with his words. Uh, he's very convincing in the, in the ways that he uses his words, the way that he speaks. Then they said, oh, if you compare Billy Graham to Charles Templeton, oh, he's not that very eloquent. He kind of has this southern drawl that, you know, it's just kind of no one really want to listen to him. He's very simple in the words that he uses. And so they, at the very beginning, they, they compared the two of them together. And they always said that, you know, well, Charles Templeton, he's, you know, he's the guy. He's uh, going to be a, good, a great preacher in the future and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, to make a long story short, Charles Templeton ended up falling away from the faith. And we know what ended up happening with Billy Graham. He became one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century. He met with every sitting president, probably the 1950s, late early 1950s, all the way till at least uh, President George Bush. I think maybe even Obama, they met with him uh, during his presidency. They, they had a chance to meet together. And uh, just very, very influential. Led many, many people to, to Christ. Millions of people all throughout the United States uh, went to his uh, crusades, heard the gospel, many giving their life to the Lord for the first time. Um, but not too many people have heard of Charles Templeton. He ended up falling away from the faith. And this guy who wrote this book, The Case for Faith, his name is Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel had an interview with Charles Templeton. Basically, he said, you know, like, what happened? You know, like, what, you know, how, how did you fall away from the faith? You know, what, what were the things that you, uh, you know, that made you stop believing in God? And he said, oh, you know, I saw this one picture of, of an African lady with her dying infant son. And I thought to myself, if God would only send rain for them. And uh, he talked about his wife's family's journey. It must have been her father or mother, I'm not sure. A uh, journey with Alzheimer's. It's a disease of the brain that you start to kind of lose your mental capabilities. And it was just terrible. And I said, how can God... Let this happen. And so the book answers some of these questions. How would a good God allow difficult things to happen? And so they had this big, long conversation. And it started to come around to Jesus. And so Lee Strobel, he said to him, he said, what do you think about Jesus? And he said, oh, man, Jesus, he, is the, he was the greatest person who ever lived. And so Lee Strobel said, do you think he, that there was... Definitely a Jesus. He said, oh, absolutely. There definitely was a Jesus. He was a great teacher, a great rabbi. And, and uh, so they just got talking. And, and Lee Strobel describes Charles Templeton's change in his face and his, in his heart as they're talking. And it led to this one question that Lee Strobel asked him. He said, well, what do you think about Jesus right now? And he said, he said, I miss him. He said, I miss him. And he started crying. He said, I miss Jesus. And it, it, to me, that's, obviously that's the story that I remember the most. I don't remember much else about that book. But it was really touching to me that someone who had that experience with Jesus, that faith, salvation, freedom-giving, peace-filling experience, misses his Savior. And I've thought to myself, I read this book a number of years ago, and I've always thought to myself, I don't ever want to become someone who misses Jesus. I want that daily experience, that daily peace with him, that daily connection, that daily communion with him. I don't want to ever be somebody who misses Jesus. Once we become Christians, we are welcomed into a family, God's family, through faith, we become a part of God's family. We now have peace with God. But it's something that we need to continue to live out on a daily basis. The Bible says that, you know, our lives belong to him. We're dead. Our old lives are dead. We're a new creation. We are resurrected with Jesus. 
It's not the same life that we live anymore, but it's a new resurrection life. We don't have a right to ourselves anymore. But the abundant life is life with Jesus. It's the life that we were created to live. God has a purpose for you. God has a life for you. And only when you are truly his can you really be yourself. Because that's who you were created to be. You were created to live in victory. You were created to live in peace. You were created to live in an overcoming, exciting life that God has for you. Only when you are fully his can you ever truly be yourself. Now that we are believers, we must daily walk in communion and obedience to him. It's a journey that we are all on to live closer and closer to him every day. He is our Savior, but he is also our Lord. He is also our Lord. Angie, in her, uh, in the beginning, read a verse from Psalms, and it says, we are, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And I love that imagery of a sheep. A sheep has nothing. <laughs> they don't have claws. They don't have fangs. They can't take care of themselves. They don't have... You know, even pigs have like a little snout where they can dig in the ground. The sheep don't have any of that stuff. They got fur. Yeah, but, you know, what happens is that gets all cut off and somebody gets to use it. Sheep are dependent on the shepherd. Okay? But that's what Jesus likens us to. We are a sheep. Okay? Listen to what it says in John chapter 10. I think we might have it up on the screen there. Yeah, look at that. There we go. All right. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the door by which we enter. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So what does the sheep hear? What do the sheep hear? His voice. Okay, I heard a voice. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> the sheep hear the voice. And what do the sheep do? Follow. All right. Okay, the sheep hear a voice. What do the sheep need to do? The sheep need to follow. What happens if the sheep don't follow? Huh, they get lost, right? The shepherd, come on, sheep, come on, sheep. She, sheep walks, or the shepherd walks over this way. The sheep's over here looking at the sky, eating some weeds over here. The shepherd's trying to lead him over to the nice green grass over here. Like, oh man, these thorns look good. And they start munching on them. And then they stop and look around. Where'd the shepherd go? They're off doing their own thing, and they wonder where the shepherd went. And the shepherd was calling them, come on, come on, come on. We can be like the sheep sometime. But what we need to do is we need to listen. We need to listen, and we need to follow. Let's continue reading. Sheep hear his voice. He calls out his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Verse 4. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Next week, we're going to talk more about how we can have peace in our own selves. But I want to just take one more, maybe about five more minutes, to talk about one point that we can do in order to continue having peace with God. Continue having peace with God. We receive salvation, but then we need to live a life that's worthy of our Savior, worthy of our Lord. This is a simple, simple way that we continue to walk with God each and every day. 
It's not something where we just say, all right, thanks, God. I got it from here. No, God wants us communing with him, relationship, connected with him every single day. So what it is, is hearing and obeying. Hearing and obeying. Okay? The more, there we go, hearing and obeying. So we hear and we obey. And when we obey, something happens inside of us where our heart and our ear is tuned to the one that we're obeying. Okay? We hear and obey. And when we obey, it helps us to hear better. And when we hear again, we obey again. And we keep obeying. We keep that cycle going. Hearing, obeying. Hearing, obeying. Hearing, obeying. What happens if we don't obey? Go to the next slide. We hear and we obey. Or we don't obey. We disobey. Sorry, that shouldn't obey. That shouldn't be there. But what happens is that when we disobey, it kind of short circuits the hearing. We are choosing... When we hear something and we disobey, we are choosing to turn our ears away. We're choosing to turn our ears away and saying, no, God didn't really say that. Or, no, I'm going to do it my way. But then it's harder for us. It makes, us, it makes it harder for us to hear again. Because why? Because we're practicing turning away from God, turning away from our shepherd. The shepherd's calling us, but we're like, no, I like these weeds over here, God. I like, I like my way. Oh, I'm sure there's pretty good grass for everybody else over there, but, but no, no, no. He calls, we disobey. He calls, we disobey. We hear him, we disobey, we ignore, and then our ears kind of get closed. We start, we get in the habit of ignoring the word of God, the, the voice of the shepherd. So, in order for us to continue in the cycle, we need to hear and obey, and hear and obey. Let me read a quote by C.S. Lewis. It says, The more often he feels or hears without acting, the less he will be able to ever act. And in the long run, the less he will be able to hear. So the more you say, oh, that's God's voice, that's God's voice, but I'm not going to do it. That's God's voice, but I'm not going to do it, the less you will hear. But God wants you, God wants all of us in communion with God. God wants all of us in that daily connection with God, living in the abundant life, living in the peace that comes from that communion with Jesus. So, if we have been in the habit of, of disobeying or not listening to the voice of God, not obeying the voice of God, there is a way that we can come back into hearing more and more. If we go to the next slide, it's the Word of God. God gave us His Word. You want to hear the voice of the shepherd? Read His Word. Read His Word. Then you'll start to encounter situations that say, Oh, this and this and this happened? Oh, the Bible says we sh that I should do this. So then we start to obey and we start to act on it. And then we see the results of it. We see the goodness. We see the peace. We see the success, the overcoming in life. This is the way that God wants us to live. So we can bring more of the hearing in, and then we just have to obey. And then we go into the next slide, hearing and obeying again, hearing and obeying. And let's always protect the, the hearing. Let's always protect what God has for each one of us because God is speaking to you. The shepherd is speaking to you today. He's not distant. He's not far away. His promise still stands. Great is his faithfulness, just like we sang. He's speaking to you today. He's speaking to you, Carrie. He's speaking to you. He's speaking to all of us. Beat me in. He's speaking to us. He's speaking to us. Listen. Live in that peace. Act on those words that he's speaking. 
Because God has a life that's abundant. Many of us here, we've been brought in by the blood of Jesus into a relationship with God. Don't think that you can take care of it all on your own. Don't just say, God, I got this. No. The same way that we were brought in is the same thing that sustains us. That connection, that intimacy with Jesus, that surrender to him. God has a wonderful plan for your life. And it's not just something where you just kind of make it happen on your own. It's a daily, daily walk with God. And it takes faith because God always asks us to do things that are a little bit stretching for us, a little bit uncomfortable for us. But that's what faith is, doing something that's beyond us, okay? If you raise your hands in church, and that's your, you know, your kind of your go-to thing, you, know, you just raise your hands, okay, maybe God wants you to dance a little bit, okay? Oh, no, 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 I don't dance. Well, God didn't really ask you if you dance or not. The Bible says to, da to dance. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I say again, rejoice. So maybe, okay, let's get off our feet a little bit. Maybe it's just a little bit of you lift your, uh, your, your heels off of, the, off of the ground a little bit. Okay, that's a step of faith. That's great. Okay, but let's be people who intentionally take steps of faith to live the adventure. Dare I say it, that the life that God has, us, has for us is an adventure. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but God does. He's got something great for us. He wants you to step out and step into the life of grace and abundance and faith and peace for each one of us. Amen? Amen. God's got a great, great life for us. He has peace. The wall of enmity, the wall of hostility has been broken down by the blood of Jesus. We can enter in to that relationship and we can continue each and every day in that peace-filled relationship with God. Amen? God's a good God. Why don't we stand together? Stand and honor our King, Jesus. who loves us so much, who died and gave his life for us. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Jesus, you are awesome. You are wonderful. You're our Prince of Peace. And today, we acknowledge you. We want to say thank you for tearing down that wall of hostility. Everything that we put up, everything that we said, no, God, I'm going to do it on my own. You said, no, I can take care of that. Selfishness, sin, pride, arrogance. You've taken care of it all. And you said, come. Come to the Father. The promise still stands. The promise still stands. If we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts, we will be saved. God, I pray that if there's anyone here today who has not confessed with their mouth and believed in their hearts, God, have your way in them. Speak to their spirit. Draw them close in your love. Because we can't do it on our own. God, and I pray if there's any of us who have tried to do it on our own. That's just as bad because we're doing it separated from you. God, we say please forgive us. Please forgive us for our self-righteousness, our legalism, our attempts to do what only you can do. God, forgive us for that. And we just come humbly to you. We come humbly to you.
Say, you are only you, Jesus. Only you, Jesus. Not me. Only you. Only you can make the way. Only you can tear down that wall. Only you are the Prince of Peace. God, every day, we commit to listening, to hearing, to obeying, and staying close to our shepherd. God, we love you so very much. We thank you that you are real, that your faithfulness is true, that the promise still stands. If everyone could do something for me, if you could close your eyes and bow your heads, I just really feel strongly that if there's anyone here who has never confessed with their mouths and believed in your heart that Jesus is Lord, I want to give you the opportunity to do that today. Jesus is here. His love is abounding to you. So if there's anybody here who has never, ever done that, would you just lift your hand up so we could see? Be brave. We've all done this at some point in our lives, a public act of response to Jesus. If there's anybody here, God's moving on your heart. You've never confessed with your mouth, believed in your heart. What we would love to do is... If that's you, we ask you to lift your hand and then come up front and meet with us. Meet with me. We can pray together. We can walk you through some steps of coming into relationship with the Prince of Peace. Anybody? Anybody at all? Lift your hand up real quick. I want to see you. Amen. God, we thank you. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your presence. Praise God. It seems like everybody has confessed with their mouths and believed in their hearts. So that's good. That's really, really good. God is here. He loves each and every one of you. If there's anybody who wants prayer, we have our prayer team up here at the front who's going to stand up here. Anything at all, pray about something we were talking about tonight or you have needs, relationships, healing. We'd love to join together in faith with you and pray together with you. So come on up to the front. If you don't have any prayer requests, you don't have anything, God bless you. Walk.